So, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and colleagues, welcome to this uh, session on the right valve for uh, the right patient. We're going to talk about lifetime management. We're also going to talk about durability. And we're going to talk about new techniques to further improve uh, our outcomes with Tavi in the short term, but also down the stretch. So I think it's a, it's a very important session. And for that, um, Nicola and myself, we have a very esteemed faculty of experts, people who are very familiar with Tavi with multiple platforms. So they will be very instrumental <laughs> in teaching us why we would choose one valve in a particular patient, but also what is important in the implant phase, but also during the follow-up of those patients. Thanks, Nicholas. Look, uh, there's a reason why we are here face-to-face. -face. Let's interact. So you got microphones all around the room. Please ask questions, make comments at any time you wish. We also have a chat master with us, Christopher Malkin, who will be um, digitally a answering and um, answering questions from uh, those who are um, with us virtually. Uh, but with that, Nicholas, why don't we begin? Yeah, so basically the, the setting is clear. We're moving to lower risk patients. We've seen, for instance, yesterday the optimized pro data. We also see the three year fo forward pro data. We recently had this extensive uh, evaluation of the hemodynamic valve performance of uh, the Evolute platform. And I think it's clear that uh, this technology really is moving to lower risk patients and rightfully so. So that means that we are changing our practice. Also, the bar is getting much higher. So a first question to, uh, to Guy, maybe, is uh, how, what is your experience in these lower risk patients? Are you, are you already doing it? How, how is that moving forward? Yeah, we're, we're doing more and more low-risk patients, young low-risk patients, and um, it's very important for us to consider uh, several aspects when doing this, uh, folks. Uh, one of them, of course, is the durability of the valve, which we, um, uh, and the performance of the valve as well. Um, the ability also to uh, perform commissure alignment is extremely important for us to be able to have access to the coronary down the road. Um, I think another very important aspect of it is also the baseline anatomy of the patient uh, to understand the candidacy because if you're going to put a patient through a TAVR procedure, you have to make sure that this procedure should be equivalent to surgery. So I think it, these are very important factors that we definitely take into account. In addition to that, the fact that we're able to show significant drop in pacemaker rates uh, with, uh, with Evolute and the data of Optimized Pro was presented yesterday, as you said, is also extremely important for these folks because that's very impactful for them down the road. Sabine, you're a surgeon. You're an interventional surgeon. You've done thousands and thousands of surgical aortic valve replacements, thousands and thousands of TAVIs. Where does your mind sit now with all this TAVI data that we have that looks very, very promising. Durability, durability looks great. How do you deal with that situation in your daily practice? What's your, do you have an age cutoff? Do you have a, what's your sort of algorithm that you play in your mind from a day-to-day -day clinical practice point of view? You mean now, especially for the decision, if we would start with a TAVI or- Or surgery, correct, surgery. yeah, yeah, in, in, in a younger, Low risk yeah. patient. So, in general, we stick to the guidelines, of course. We um, usually do TAVI in patients above 75. In patients uh, uh, at the age of 70 to 75, we do very individualized decisions. And I think this is also the, the major point to bring it into one sentence. We do very individualized decisions. So, lifetime management means that we expect to have several interventions in one patient. And um, what is the best for the first? Procedure. Um, uh, so for the first procedure, we also have to take into account to pave the way for the second or third one. And um, there are many factors to take into account for this. It's uh, life expectancy of the patient, lifestyle of the patient, and um, very importantly, uh, the anatomy of the patient. So a CT, to do a CT first is very important to, to make the plans for the future. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think one thing that we have to make sure, if we're going to be doing TAVI in younger and lower-risk patients, 
we have to really understand the technical difficulty and the challenges uh, that we might encounter uh, with the patient. So the CT scan really becomes an important piece of the puzzle um, in all of this. So, so Nicolo, then when you look at the optimized pro and, and forward pro data that were presented yesterday, um, we, we do see that more than mild PVL hardly exists with the current generation platform. Also, the pacemaker rates are dropping to below 10%. Maybe a brief question to Dave. How important is that uh, in terms of valve selection for your patients? Is this like very important to know and to realize that we have now that scientific uh, background? Specifically about the pacemakers? And the PVLs? <clears throat> yeah, so I think, I mean, pacemakers... It's one of the safest things we do in medicine as a pacemaker. So it's always slightly perplexed me, this issue. But, of course, the patients really don't want it. In fact, often when you go and see someone, you've done a really hard case on them, and you go and see them and say, we've done well, you know, the valve is in the thing. And they, all they say is, do I need a pacemaker? You know, they, they're so focused on it. So, yes, it's very important you know, from the patient point of view. They, they just don't really want to have a pacemaker as well. It makes them feel very old. Yeah. A <laughs> well, but I think you raise a very important comment here because the, the need for a pacemaker, there is a lot of controversy whether that is so important in terms of long-term clinical outcome. As a matter of fact, if you look at the five-year Sertavi data and you look at the patients who required a new pacemaker after the intervention and you compare to the patients who did not have a pacemaker and you look at the pace, patients who had a pacemaker at baseline prior to the intervention, turns out that there was no difference in outcome in terms of survival at five years between the patients with no pacemakers and the patients who required a new pacemaker. It were the patients who already had a pacemaker at baseline, they had the worst outcome. So I, I do believe, I do uh, agree with you what you're saying. But I think we need to move forward with the first presentation. So why don't we, so we discussed now briefly on where we are heading with the technologies and what the technologies can bring us. So how will that affect uh, lifetime management and valve selection for an individual patient? And for that, Guy Atizani will give us a very nice first presentation. Thank you. All right, thanks for inviting me. Um, so that's the, the title, Lifetime and Prolonged Survival, what to consider when uh, we are determined about selection. This is my conflict of interest. So uh, the Evolute platform today, um, I think, has uh, consolidated uh, in terms of superior hemodynamics and a very proven uh, platform. Um, we have great long-term data with, uh, uh, with Sertavi data, as well as the Notion trial eight-year follow-up. And uh, in addition to the fact that the reduction of pacemaker rates with uh, Optimized Pro and with the cusp overlap technique, I think this, all of these taken together uh, really uh, uh, gives uh, really uh, great um, results for, for Evolute. And in the beginning of, of the experience with Tavra, right, we used to look into the outcomes, mortality, stroke, um, and, and quality of life. Uh, but now, when we're dealing with lower risk patients, right, we have to pay attention to other outcomes such as hemodynamics, patient prosthesis mismatch, and of course, the durability and the life expectancy of the patient, because these patients might need to have multiple procedures. And in addition to the fact that coronary access is extremely important as well. Obviously, as we discussed here in the beginning of the session, right, the age of the patients that are treating with TAVI is progressively reducing as we are treating uh, lower risk patients. And in that gray zone, in that, the one you see in the middle, between 65 and 80 years old, right? So these are the patients that we are uh, treating very often today, and we have to address those aspects that I mentioned before. So that's why uh, I'm, uh, my, my goal here is to show that one of these aspects, the durability aspect of Evolute, is very well consolidated in this scenario. Um, and the expectation, importantly, right, the expectation of the life ex expectancy of these patients, right, the younger, uh, younger folks that are going to treat, is 12 to 13 years old. So we have to really take this into account when we're going to decide which valve we're going to pick for our patients. This slide is a um, uh, two-year follow-up. Um, uh, this is a U.S. data, but you're going to see that this is basically 
all of the data that we see with Evolute compared with surgery, this is copy-paste, right? A consistently better hemodynamics with Evolute compared with surgical valves, delivering uh, larger EOAs as well as lower mean gradients over time. On the right-hand side of this slide, I want you to pay attention to uh, when you compare TAVR versus surgical aortic valve replacement there. When you're dealing with smaller annuli, you can see that with Evolute, there was no uh, patient prosthesis mismatch, or severe patient prosthesis mismatch, no difference between smaller, medium, and larger annuli, whereas with surgical aortic valve replacement, there was a significant uh, increase in, in patient prosthesis mismatch when we were treating patients with smaller annuli. So that's a very important piece of data for us to take into account. And why this is important? Well, because when patients do have severe patient prosthesis mismatch, uh, they, they have higher rates of mortality down the road. Um, now, looking at data comparing Sapien valve, Sapien XT, Sapien 3 versus surgery, we can see here that there was more structural valve deterioration with Sapien XT versus surgical uh, aortic valve replacement. And when we look at bi bioprosthetic valve failure, right, comparing Sapien 3 versus surgery, there were higher rates over time. You can see when, the, when we go to uh, year two, three, and four, uh, up to the fifth year here, there were higher rates of, of bioprosthetic valve failure with Sapien 3 versus surgical aortic valve replacement. As I mentioned in the beginning, the long-term follow-up of, of the Notion trial, it's very similar to that initial graph that I showed you, which is consistently better hemodynamics for self-expandable device versus, uh, versus um, surgical aortic valve replacement, with larger EOAs and lower mean gradients. Um, despite the fact that there was no difference in all-cause mortality, but structural valve deterioration was more frequently observed in surgical aortic valve replacement. If you use the definition that you see on the screen there, or if you change the definition for structural valve deterioration, as we know there are different definitions for that, still there, were, there was a better performance of Evolute compared with, of core valve I should say, compared with, with surgical aortic valve replacement. As we know, the only uh, randomized study comparing the, the two, uh, the balloon expandable platform uh, versus the self-expandable platform showing uh, consistently uh, larger EOAs and lower mean gradients with Evolute. And uh, on the right-hand side, you can see that at the fifth year follow-up, there were high rates of uh, structural valve deterioration with Sapien valve. It's important to highlight, however, that these are the initial generation of these devices. And because we believe that durability is a very important aspect to consider in these patients, we did do this meta-analysis that you can see uh, on the screen there, that we took, in, we took uh, 10 randomized controlled trials. But just to summarize that, the graph that you see on the screen is very similar to the other ones that I showed you in the beginning. So better hemodynamics with Evolute with larger EOAs, lower mean gradients, and structural valve deterioration was more frequently observed with uh, surgical valves and with balloon expandable valves compared with Evolute. So Evolute had the best performance comparing uh, these uh, three. And just to finalize, another very important aspect that we, we talked about valve performance, and we have to take into account that the patients we're treating right now, these younger folks who are going to exercise, right? Not only it's important to have great hemodynamics at rest, but it's also important to understand what's going to happen when they exert themselves. And because of that, we're, we did this study, which is basically patients that we put them inside an MRI scanner. They can actually do a treadmill while they're, not a treadmill, sorry, a bike, while they're inside the MRI scanner. It's a very unique setup, showing that on the screen that the increase in gradients with Sapien was much higher than with Evolute, right? This is just 10 patient experience which is opening an avenue for a larger study that we're starting right now. But I think that is very provocative, and I think it's very relevant for patients who are going to be exerting themselves. Just to summarize, supranular self-expandable transcatheter heart valves provided consistently lower mean, uh, mean gradients and larger EOAs, up to eight-year follow-up, as I showed in the Notion trial. Um, the analysis of the core valve high risk demonstrated increased risk for patient prosthesis mismatch with surgical aortic valve replacement. Remember the graph that I showed you? So with, 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 with uh, core valve, there was no difference in severe PPM if you're dealing with smaller, medium, and larger annuli, whereas that happened with surgical valves, right? At five-year follow-up, uh, with the partner trial, there was more uh, structural valve, um, uh, bi-prosthetic uh, bi valve failure with Sapien 3 compared with surgical valves. 
great results of the Notion trial, eight year follow up. And just to finalize, the results of our meta analysis showing the best performance of Evolute compared with balloon expandable valves as well as the surgical valves. Thanks for your attention. So that was an excellent question. There was an interesting remark fr uh, from the chat, and that is about the CT scanning. And we all know that CT scanning is very important for the planning of a TAVI procedure. Um, but how important is CT, Sabina, for a surgeon? Is it, is it relevant in contemporary surgery when you do a surgical aortic valve? Would you want to have a CT scan these days? Or do you believe that the CT scan will have an added value to do it more systematically? So uh, surgeons um, have not been used to um, to have a CT uh, to plan their, their surgical procedures, but as I'm doing TAVI also, I, I learned uh, the big value of this, and to me it is extremely helpful to plan procedures, and um, I would be very happy if every patient could have a CT um, um, for planning of aortic valve procedure um, of any kind. But, but it's not a routine yet. No, it's not a routine, and, and I'm not sure if this will come. But it's extremely helpful. It can tell me how big is the valve. Do I expect patient prosthesis mismatch? Should I plan an aortic root enlargement? Are there any calcifications on the ascending aorta, which might increase the risk for stroke? And so many, many factors there. Is it a bicuspid valve? Which type? So there was also this age thing. Sure, and, and maybe some class effects. So before I, I ask Stefan a tough question, um, please, if, you, if there's any comments or questions, use the microphones. We want to make this really interactive. So please feel free. So Stefan, back to the tough question. Um, Guillaume really presented some interesting data about devices. Now, in the guidelines, we always hear TAVI, 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 TAVI. So what we're seeing, is this a class effect? Or should we be really thinking about specific devices when we look at younger aged patients? It's, it's likely a class effect. So let's talk about age a little bit and take out this some subjectivity in this whole issue. And let's just take a look at the two major randomized trials in low-risk patients comparing TAVI with the surgery. That's the PARTNER-3 trial and the EVOLUTE low-risk trial. The mean age uh, of patients in these trials was uh, 73 and 74. So that's the mean age. That also tells us that a lot of these patients were actually in their 60s. So when we think about such young patients, it's probably a wise idea not to only look at individual trials, but also think about lifetime management, because a lot of these patients will require a second or even a third a valve. Um, the uh, 2020 US guidelines take, in, at least in my view, a quite a balanced approach uh, in this regard. So they recommend between the ages of 65 and 80, to discuss this overall issue and to make, uh, in the end, um, a shared decision uh, um, between the patient, between the surgeon, and between the interventionalist. Unfortunately, the, the European guidelines didn't follow this line of thought, but that's probably the most sensible approach in my view. Nicholas, perhaps we're not there yet, but for <clears> sure not all you know, human beings are made equal and not all TAVI devices are made equal. I think we're going to eventually understand in the future, perhaps, which valves have the best durability. True, but, and, but at the same time, I believe that a more patient-tailored valve selection may also uh, be very relevant at one point. Uh, that said, I think in the discussion uh, of valve selection, but also in the selection to proceed with surgery or TAVI, the question or the issue of bioprosthetic valve degeneration keeps on lingering and I think it's about time now to go to the second lecture and that is Professor David Hildig Smith who is going to give us an update on current knowledge of uh, durability and bioprosthetic valve performance. Dave. Great, thanks very much Nicholas. So quite a few things to try and cover in a few minutes here but I'll focus mainly on durability. So, uh, although we wish it were otherwise, it is true, I'm afraid, that all bioprosthetic valves will fail eventually if the patient lives long enough. So we must remember that. We will not be invincible. Uh, 
Structural valve deterioration and bioprosthetic valve failure are the, the definitions to which you work. And I'm, going to, I'm not going to read all this to you because there's a bit too much. Safe to say they're relatively complicated. And perhaps the most useful thing for me to show you is the Venn diagram, which shows that severe valve degeneration already counts as bioprosthetic valve failure in the definitions that we currently have. So I think what Nico was alluding to, and I fully agree, all valves are different. Some transcatheter valves will be excellent and some will not in terms of durability. As we know from surgery, some valves are great, some are not. This is the data about the truly terrible trifecta valve um, which I hope is not being sold anymore, but I think maybe it is, uh, which uh, we hate particularly because you can't break it as well, uh, although it keeps coming up in patients to be treated. And this, compared with the intuity, shows uh, that it fails much earlier for reasons that are not entirely clear, but obviously the durability is not so great. We've already seen this slide, so you can see a couple of slides you've seen before, which shows that both me and Guillaume think they're very important. This is five-year follow-up of the uh, Sapien, the balloon expandable data, showing less good outcomes than with surgery. A little bit unexpected, I think, when this data first appeared. On top of that, we know that if you put a smaller valve in rather than a bigger valve, obviously you, you have to work with the annular size you're dealing with, but if you put a smaller valve in, you will of course get, in the blue line here, higher gradients. And this is important not just because it's a number, but because it actually is reflected in mortality. If you look at combined TAVI and surgical aortic valve replacements in the lowest annular sizes and stratify this according to patient prosthesis mismatch, you get the same outcomes, that there's a mortality disadvantage if you have severe patient prosthesis mismatch. In the core valve low risk study, we had good gradients at to two years and good valve areas. So we're beginning to see a difference between the balloon expandable and the self-expanding systems. The Notion study, well ahead of its time, as many Scandinavian studies are, you've actually seen this slide also already, but I want to draw your attention to one key aspect of it. Very good outcomes generally, but we begin to see at six, seven, and eight years, the structural valve deterioration that we're expecting, we will eventually see it, and here you see that it's more prevalent in the surgical valves than in the transcatheter valves, which in this particular study was, uh, all of them were core valve. So the most recent pooled analysis from the core valve evolute studies is now out to five years. And you can see that the surgical results are for a 4% serious valve degeneration out to five years, compared to 2.5% for the transcatheter valve. And when you look at the patients who have small annulus, that's obviously worse in the surgical group, because usually, nearly always, they will have a sewing ring as well, and that impairs the outcomes even further. Whereas with the transcatheter valve, in small annulus that doesn't have a sewing ring, of course, you have much lower rates. Similarly, if you look at TAVI versus surgery, you'll see a lower rate of structural valve deterioration in those with a large annulus. So it's not just confined to those with small. These are very compelling data, I think. If you look at a meta-analysis of all the valve studies, I don't usually like meta-analyses much because they take other people's work and then claim credit for it, but uh, this one was quite a good one, and I'll just draw attention to the essential conclusion, which was that in terms of structural valve deterioration, and I think it's really pretty clear now that this is true, that you have a better outcome if you can use a self-expanding valve and have a good result than you do with the balloon expandable valves. Uh, similarly, versus SAVA, you get 
differences that you can see here between the self and the balloon expandable valves. So I think the things we thought were true actually are true after all. The things that we intuitively expected are true. The sewing ring occupies space. That's bad for the valve area. It's bad for the valve gradient. It's bad for valve longevity. Patient prosthesis mismatch is commoner with surgical valves and results in higher valve gradients, smaller areas, reduced patient survival. The self-expanding superannular valve is better. And it's better in terms of valve area, valve gradient, longevity. And if you can, the larger valve implant is also better. Valve gradient, valve area, valve longevity. Do I have one minute for management? There was a lot to cover in this talk, but I will talk very briefly about management. Okay, management, when you have severe structural valve deterioration, and what are you going to do? Well, you have to do the same as you did originally. You, this is a mechanical problem. There are, tablets are no use. You need another valve, as long as the patient is symptomatic. So we have one very main consideration, which is all I'm going to touch on here, which is about the coronary arteries. And we have three classifications, if you like, of valves. There's the obligate coronary covering, TAVI valve. Then there's the optional coronary covering and the non-covering, the now sadly demised lotus. Uh, if this comes back for uh, revalving, this would be a piece of cake. You can do whatever you like in that. Very straightforward. Most of the balloon expandable valves that come back also very straightforward. This one, very, very straightforward. But this one, beware. You will seal off the coronaries if you just put a new valve in this. For the obligate coverage valves, we're going to be looking at commissural alignment. You will have two layers of lattice. It will be something which has to be thought about over time. For the accurate neo valve, access will be good. For the core valve, access not always perfect. And it's something that's going to have to be considered over time. And last point, will current obsession with high valve implants, which necessarily lead us to potentially obstructing the coronaries, come back to bite us in cases where valve and valve TAVI is needed? I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent, Dave. Um, from the chat, there are some questions related to calcium. We'll cover that in the next presentation in a second. But um, basically, prosthesis patient mismatch is an important item that was discussed in uh, Dave's talk. And uh, I have the impression that the surgical community is getting more and more sensitive to it. And we also see that in randomized controlled trials. If you look at the high-risk patients, studies and you compare it to the lower risk, then surgeons have been implanting larger valves. So the question to you, Sabine, is, uh, is it true that prosthesis patient mismatch is an item in the surgical community and, and is everybody or the surgeons are getting more sensitive to this and aiming for higher, uh, bigger valves and considering, for instance, root enlargement? <clears throat> So patient prosthesis mismatch um, has been uh, discussed since the 70s uh, in the surgical community and I think in, in most uh, departments it is a um, uh, usual uh, treatment that we have lists in the OR with uh, mean EOAs that can be expected and we always um, calculate the expected EOA for, for the individual patient before we implant a valve. So I would say that's what most surgeons do. And that's something we could also implement for transcatheter heart valves to, to build lists with um, mean effective orifice areas for each size and type of um, the valves so that we can predict uh, which uh, effective orifice area we could um, expect. Nicholas, I, I, I agree with Sabine. I think that's a, an extremely important point you make, Sabine. Um, you know, I think it was in 2018, uh, Rebecca Hahn published uh, some nice tables uh, where the, they're almost like, you know, they've taken all the randomized data uh, for a self-expanding balloon expandable. And for each valve size, they gave the average expected EOA that they got in the trials. 
And so what you can do is take those expected EOAs from that table and divide the patient's body surface area. And with, by doing that, you'll get a number. That is your indexed EOAI, effective orifice, or your PPM number. And so I, I think we need to, you know, I don't do it in my practice. I always tell myself I should look at it, you know, but perhaps, and again, no valves are equal. And so different valves for a given annuli give you different effective orifice areas. So maybe we should be moving towards that. Well, maybe. the concept is very important. Maggie, go Just ahead. Just one, one comment. Can you turn on my microphone, please? Thank you. So I think this is a very relevant question, uh, indeed. Uh, I think when we're doing our hard team meetings, we're going to try to, we're going to treat patients that are younger and lower risk, right? We have to, number one, understand who is our team, right? What is the level of comfort of our surgeons, for example, to do root enlargement, right? In a patient with a smaller annula, right? Or a smaller root. Because this is important because that's going to, we have to take this into account in the risk profile of the patient. Right? And, and, I, and the question that Nico asked in the beginning, I don't think it's a class effect, right? So we have to take all of these factors into account. So I'm considering doing a TAVR versus, versus surgery in a patient who is young, but has a small root. Oh, by the way, I have to do root enlargement in the surgical procedure, oh, but, but my surgeon is not comfortable doing root enlargement. That happens a lot. Uh, multiple centers in the United States, I know it happens, and I'm sure it happens in Europe as well. So we have to take all of these factors into account when we're going to decide what's going to be the therapy we're going to offer to this patient, right? In addition, another important aspect that Nico, uh, Nico brought up as well is the fact that the CT scan analysis is fundamental. It's, it's, it's a must because we need to understand when this patient needs an additional procedure down the road, what is the anatomy of this patient? Well, the patient has a very narrow, as, as, as David showed now, very narrow STJ, low coronary takeoff. I'm not concerned with uh, acute occlusion in the procedure, but what's going to happen down the road? So all of these factors must be taken into account when we're deciding what to do with this patient. Our responsibility as operators has increased dramatically when we're addressing these patients, and we should, as a heart team, take all of this into account. Well, and you can go even a, a step further. We are all considering now these upstream TAVI indications. Assume a patient with moderate aortic stenosis, the valve area will be between one and 1.5 centimeters square. If you would replace that valve with a valve that would result in a valve area of 1.4, you're not paying this patient a service. So this uh, valve area, the expected valve areas that you will get after a TAVI or a surgical valve replacement are becoming very essential also in the context of upstream TAVI. But time is running and it's time now to discuss the role of thrombus and calcium in structural valve degeneration and uh, Dr. Bleitzifer will give that presentation. Thank you. So we uh, start with a polling question. How if you suspect a leaflet thrombosis in a patient after TAVI, would you give Coumadin, Norx, or something else, fibrinolysis, or doing nothing, wait and see? Can I, um, okay, so this is how calcifications and thrombi can look like when valves are explanted. And um, I'm happy that this was addressed also before because it always sounds so complex how to define and describe uh, biprosthetic valve dysfunction. To make it very easy, you um, um, distinguish between etiology and severity. For the etiology, there are four big um, reasons why valves uh, have a dysfunction. It's structural valve dis deterioration, it's non-structural, such as mismatch or paravalvular leakage, it's thrombosis or endocarditis. And um, then we have stages of the severity. We have stages of severity of by prosthetic valve dysfunction or deterioration. And then if we have severe by prosthetic valve dysfunction, it's failure also that has um, several stages, 
going to re-intervention or valve-related death. And um, there are several definitions from the EAPCI statement, VIVID, um, VAC3, but uh, this is the essentials of, of all those definitions. When we have a closer look at the calcium, we can recognize there are two types of distribution of the calcium. Um, it may um, be within a thrombus, which is on the leaflet, and then my uh, trigger a sequence of thrombosis, fibrosis, and calcification, and then degeneration of the valve. And uh, there may be intrinsic calcifications, which we call the, the typical structural valve deterioration when the calcium is within the leaflet of a bioprosthesis. We also know from um, surgical valve replacement that um, this um, structural valve deterioration is triggered by leaflet stress, and mechanical leaflet stress can be um, visualized in, in uh, computational models. And uh, we can see that the most uh, mechanical leaflet stress is on the commissures and uh, usually in the mid portion of the sinuses. And uh, we also know that from, from surgical um, implantations also that the longer the leaflets, the less is the stress. And that's why in this uh, study it could be demonstrated that the core valve had lower leaflet stress than the sapien valve, which has shorter leaflets. Also, difference between um, surgical bioprosthesis and TAVI is a higher rate of uh, thrombosis or subclinical um, types of thrombosis, like as Holt and HEM, um, in transcatheter heart valves. And um, one potential reason for this is um, that there are areas of flow stasis um, when a transcatheter heart valve is implanted. This study demonstrated that these areas are especially between the leaflet and the stent, so in the new sinus, but there are also more spaces, also the native valve still inside, and then creating a lot of spaces where flow stasis may occur. And this is to demonstrate you how uh, important imaging can be and also that it can have therapeutic implications. You see here um, a 4D CT of a patient uh, with a clinical thrombosis, so with um, a gradient increase. And um, at my center, we investigate a new method of imaging with a um, um, positron emerson tomography with a, a radioactive marker, FGP1, that um, detects activated thrombocytes. You see that in the middle that uh, we could demonstrate that the uh, thrombotic uh, sites uh, or locations of the valve can be detected with this new imaging tool. And we could also demonstrate that when we administer Coumadine for three months, after that time on um, CT, the thrombosis is gone, and also in the PET CT, um, there is no um, thrombi uh, detectable anymore. But what we could also demonstrate in a patient was uh, that on CT there was no thrombosis anymore, but in, with this new imaging tool we could detect residual um, activated thrombocytes. Um, that means maybe this uh, tool is even more sensitive than the CT, and it uh, led us to continue the uh, Coumadine administration in this patient. So I summarize uh, calcifications and thrombus formation are important factors for the durability of bioprosthetic valves. There are many influencing factors to this. It's dent design, leaflet design uh, to trigger leaflet stress and um, 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 areas of flow stasis, but it's also the anti-calcification uh, treatment and maybe also the crimping, which we still do not really understand um, how important um, micro injuries to the valve during the loading or crimping is. And um, I, I showed you a new imaging tool that shows us how important it is to detect the cause of a valve deterioration and um, to treat it. Thank you. So do we get the results of the poll? Yeah. Are they coming up? Yep. No, that's clear. You do need some oral anticoagulant drug therapy. <laughs> and it's a 50-50 split. 50-50, interesting. And counting. <laughs>
Well, obviously, antiplatelets do not work in the context of leaflet thickening uh, and leaflet thrombosis. So, obviously, that uh, message already got through the community, and rightfully so. Um, I still um, am in doubt whether this leaflet thickening by itself is clinically relevant. Obviously, when it has an impact on uh, gradients and you see a change in gradients occurring from early discharge to a couple of months later, okay, that would really trigger me. But otherwise, I don't know, Nicolo, what is your perception to this? Yeah, look, uh, you know, you, it's a clinical syndrome, right? So if I'm going to go ahead and treat a patient, um, there needs to be, you know, the imaging evidence, but also the clinical evidence. Um, and, and so it, it's, yeah, you, you, you sort of have to make a clinical judgment as to when you're going to start these medications. But Sabine, really, I was blown away by your PET scan. Really, I, you know, in the, this is probably going to be the one thing that, that I leave this PCR with saying, wow, that is mind boggling. You know, we're, we're, what you've demonstrated is that it looked good on the CT scan, it looked good on the echo, but there was still something going on on the PET and you continued the anticoagulation. You know, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, but it's so interesting. And I, I wanted to ask you, like, is, is this tracer, is this something on a research protocol? Is it something that someone can get easily? Um, are there any side effects? Not aware of any side effects. It's um, in a testing phase. It's not yet um, approved. Um, it needs an approval study. Okay, so that. the radio tracer we use that it is. And, but also the group um, around uh, Bing et al., which uh, were co authors um, in the Jack paper, yeah. are using that. But okay. there is radiation involved, right? Right, yeah. yeah. So you always have to be cautious about that. And, but I think it's also fair to say that systematic CT follow-up after it, Davi, is a no-go. You, right. should, you should no, not we, implement it. We only it used it in clinically um, there you go. Um, symptomatic yeah. patients. Yeah. 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 But I do see a lot of experts in the audience, and I do want to ask one of my friends a small question. So if you, Arik, if you have a patient with leaflet thrombosis, you know, leaflet thickening, and there is an increase in gradient, you put the patient on a VKA, would you stop after six months or would you, and for instance, the patient has no bleeding issues, would you continue? What, what is your take on that? Uh, first of all, I got no answer to your question because I think it depends on the patient. There's no answer for this because there is no price for me for a failed valve after a year. So I'll put any effort I can, so my first choice will be Coumadin, as long as it's not an old patient with extreme bleeding tendency. If it is, then I'll choose the NOC, but the default is definitely as much as I can uh, to resolve the problem. So this is regarding that. Uh, otherwise, I truly don't have an answer. I mean, uh, we're all dealing with it. We're all not doing CT routinely after. Uh, but we should uh, try and uh, follow the patients as much as we can because what we invest in Tavi those days, and it's not just in Israel or in Germany, but in the entire world, uh, is something that we have not seen previously in cardiology. So we should put any effort we can in clinical follow-up and uh, so-called cheap imaging in order to uh, find this as soon as possible and then do the, what we need. Yeah, thank you for sharing that opinion. I will give you mine. If, uh, if a patient would have an increase in gradient because of leaflet thickening, I, will, I would keep the patient on a NOAC or a vitamin K unless there are bleeding issues. So I would not stop anymore. But that is not, of course, evidence-based. That is more empirical, uh, practice-based. Uh, okay, we maybe quickly go through a couple of scenarios in uh, younger patients. So, what would be very, in, what would be important, uh, or would be your perspective? For instance, in terms of paravalvular leak in younger patients, is that uh, what is the rate of moderate paravalvular leak that you would allow, Sabine? Would it be five percent? Would it be 10%? What is it? 
it must be zero percent. I would say. I think we all consent. Uh, we all agree that um, moderate leakage has an impact on uh, survival and on outcomes, and so we have to avoid it completely. Mm -hmm. And I think there is still conflicting data how much impact uh, um, a mild uh, paravalvular leakage has. We have conflicting data. Nobody knows in the end it um, is a gradual um, increase of uh, risk of um, impaired outcomes. So we should also avoid as much as possible mild leakages. Yeah. And obviously when we do a TAVI, it's more than just uh, get the job done, get the valve in and, and go away. You also have to be sensitive to the coronaries. So Stefan, what is your approach in younger patients to the coronaries? Go quick and dirty, get that valve in or pay some attention to some other aspects of the implant? Mike, yeah. So the first consideration would be your valve choice, because the uh, a low uh, um, a frame valve, such as the Sapien, makes it a lot easier to engage the coronaries. But it is still possible, or uh, the norm, uh, with an evolute valve, uh, although it might be a little trickier. But in the vast majority of cases, it is still possible. Um, it becomes more complex when you think into the future uh, if for the scenario when you have to put a second TAVI in the first TAVI. So as you all know, this will create a so-called neoskirt and it will be impossible to engage the coronaries through the neoskirt. So you have to think beforehand when you have a younger patient which valve to put in and to think about the future. So we'll get to that later on in, uh, in this session. Uh, maybe on conduction disorders and pacemakers, Guy, what, what is your take in younger patients? What, what, what can we ex accept and what would be unacceptable? Yeah, that's a very relevant question. Uh, I think we have to, the numbers speak for, I mean, the number of, of, of optimized pro now single digit pacemaker rates. I think we have to aim at achieving close to surgical results, right? We know that, that with, the, with the current technique, uh, pacemaker rates drop tremendously, right? We remember the initial era of core valve, 30, uh, close to 30% pacemaker rates. So I think we have to really strive to achieve uh, the best possible result for our patients, minimize interaction with the conduction system. Really, when we're doing the procedure, really start at halfway through the pigtail, let the valve go down, the, minimize the interaction. It's fundamental. It's very, very important. And that leads to you know, single-digit pacemaker rates. If we really want to mimic surgical results, that's a very important piece to consider. Yeah, I agree. And you want to minimize the interaction with the LVOT as much as possible. But we have the master of uh, the double S-curve and these new implant techniques among us. So, Nicolo, why, why don't you lead us through uh, the principles of these new implant techniques that also looks into the, the cusps? So it's not new. That's the first thing. <laughs> it's uh, approximately 10 years old. So, you know, back in, in 2010, um, there was a problem. Uh, the problem was that we'd get into the cath lab, um, we'd go in a three-cusp coplanar view, which would be somewhere around AP or LAO cranial, and then the operator would go caudal in LAO in order to get the delivery catheter in plane. You remember that? and we'd come off the aortic annulus S-curve. So now your delivery catheter is in plane, but you are out of plane with your anatomy. And so there was this whole conundrum back then. I remember we used to have debates. Do you stick on the curve or do you stick on the delivery catheter? And so I, I made a phone call to one of my students one night and I said, can you develop some formula where we can understand where on the curve where is that single view where both the anatomy and delivery catheter are both in plane? That was the goal. And so what we ended up doing was we got the aortic annulus S-curve that you see there in yellow. And then we developed the S-curve of the delivery catheter. We're not going to go into details on how you do that, but you just need two orthogonal views, about 30 degrees apart. Um, you take those two views of the delivery catheter and plane, put it into a mathematical equation, you'll get the S-curve of the delivery catheter, and it does something like this. 
and I'll make it a little bit thicker so we can see. Now, these two S-curves, where the annulus is in plane and where the delivery catheter is in plane, were always intersecting in ario caudal. And we've been doing this since 2013. And so, what was the reason that in 95% of cases, we were going in ario caudal? So, if you're going to plant a coronary stent in the proximal LAD. Who's going to do it in AP caudal? No one. Who's going to go maybe cranial? Of course you will, because you're going to reduce the foreshortening and you're going to elongate the proximal LAD. So it's the same thing here that's happening. In the ario caudal viewpoint, okay, you elongate, you get a three chamber view of the heart, just like a three-chamber view on echo. So your LVOT is elongated. If you elongate the anatomy, you're going to elongate your catheter. In the AP view, you literally foreshorten your anatomy. Your LVOT is foreshortened, your aortic root towards the LVOT is foreshortened. So, of course, if your catheter follows the anatomy, your catheter is going to be foreshortened. So, I went to Proctor a few places back in 2016, and one of those places was with Hamal Gada. And, you know, we did this whole complicated double S curve, and he called me the next day and he said, Nico, I think you're isolating the non-coronary cusp. And I think you're overlapping the right and left. I said, okay, let me try it. So I kept on doing the double S, but in the meantime, I, started, I realized, I said, you know what, Hemal is right. And the double S curve, or I should say the cusp overlap, and I'll explain what the cusp overlap is in just a second, in about 90 to 95 percent of cases, closely, closely matches the double S. And that double S, like we said, gets your delivery catheter in plane and your annulus in plane. So if you do the cusp overlap and you advance your delivery catheter and your delivery catheter looks perfectly in plane, you've got the perfect position. Now, the cusp overlap technique, what we're actually doing is we're isolating the non coronary cusp and we're overlapping the right and left cusp. And you can see here that we elongate the LVOT, and we're in a three-chamber view. Now, the three-chamber view or a cusp overlap technique has some additional advantages. On echo, when you measure the LVOT in a three-chamber, we know we're measuring the minor axis. That's why we don't use it for sizing. But on fluoroscopy, if you're implanting in an areocaudal view, three-chamber view, you're getting the minor axis. You'll understand sooner when you make contact with the annulus. The LVOT is elongated, but the problem is that you're, you have overlap of your ascending and descending aorta. And so instead of your aorta looking like this, it's sort of looking like this. And so you lose that push-pull feeling. So, Nicholas, this is sort of a, the, the background to the cusp overlap technique and, and some of the advantages. But yeah, maybe we can have a sort of little discussion on, you know, the advantages and disadvantages of implanting an ario caudal and what the implications have been for clinical outcomes. Yeah, well, there's not that much time, but we can briefly go into that. So, I, I you know, Optimize Pro basically used and used uh, explicitly the cusp overlap uh, view. It introduced uh, six different aspects of that technique. And by following that, eventually the result was that your pacemaker rate was, dro was dropping below 10%. Uh, 
and also no PVL uh, involved and no issues with coronary obstructions and so on. So I think mission, mission accomplished in that regard. That said, um, there are some nuances, I think. Um, sometimes I do implant stents uh, in a proximal LED in a caudal view, and there are several reasons why you should do it. At the same time, I don't use the cusp overlap to assess the depth of implant. As a matter of fact, we did a CT study that was recently published where we demonstrated that the correlation, the accuracy of a depth assessment in the coplanar view with the three cusps aligned and a, a depth assessment in the cusp overlap view really does not correlate with the real depth as assessed by CT scanning. So there, are, there is more than, I mean, this is a very important research and I think we are improving our insights tremendously. And the way that we are looking at fluoroscopy these days is different from 10 years ago. So I, I also use cusp overlap, but not as my only projection. So where I used to only use a coplanar view and just stick to that and that's it, now I will use two views, and by CT scanning up front, I will determine my coplanar view with the three cusps aligned, and I also will determine my cusp overlap view. And, and that is basically yep. now my practice. I don't know, Dave, what is, what is your take on this? Actually, yeah, I do exactly the same. Uh, I think, you know, the, the, the one problem that is frequent with the cusp overlap view is, is if you have got your cusps overlapped, but they're not perfect, you don't always know without taking the second view well, which, which one is the lower one of the two. And so you can get mistaken and you can find that actually your overlap is not as perfect as you thought it was. So I do exactly the same. I, I have the, the three cusp view to start with and then go to two cusp in almost all cases. Yeah. So okay, this just all make one quick comment. Very, very quick, quick. I promise. Uh, I, think the, the, I think what Nico said is the, the fact that you elongate the LVOT made operators very comfortable with this technique. And also the amount of investment in education for people, I think uh, the advantage of customer life, it's very much reproducible. Because in the beginning, I would do X, Nico would do Z, you do, people would do different things. I think customer overlap came here to standardize the way of implantation. And ultimately, it led to greater outcomes across the board. If you look at data from the United States, non-randomized, and now the, now the, the, the optimized pro data as well, uh, I think it's just uh, great because it was able to standardize the procedure. I think that's a big thing for this, for this device, and the results are... Okay, here. so let's switch gears. So we are moving to younger patients, longer life expectancy, more years with the valve uh, in situ. So that means that we will see more and more degeneration of prosthesis. Not only surgical prosthesis, but we will also start seeing these degenerating transcatheter heart valves. As a matter of fact, in, in the thorax center these days, uh, we start to see patients who are more than 10 years after their first TAVI procedure. And from time to time, these valves are degenerating. And you will see uh, central ARs, you will see um, the, the increase of gradients at, at one point. It's not a very common finding, but my gut feeling tells me that there is more to come. If it's a surgical bioprosthesis will degenerate, also a transcatheter bioprosthesis may degenerate. Maybe a first question before we go to the recorded live case to Stefan, uh, what are the risks of proceeding with a, with a transcatheter valve in a failing transcatheter prosthesis? So my, my main concern would be uh, with the coronaries. That is both coronary occlusion or at least under perfusion, uh, which is rare, likely rare, but future coronary axis, that's really something you have to separate from, from malperfusion and that's becoming quite frequent if you don't take, uh, take, pay particular attention to the details of the procedure. Another, another thing to consider is what's the appropriate valve size. So we don't have a consensus on that yet. Um, there are different formulas uh, you could apply. You could uh, size according to the original native annulus. You could size upon the true ID just similar to surgical uh, valves uh, of the first valve, so we don't know yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I think in the interest of time, let's go to the recorded live case. Um, that is 14 minutes. So uh, can we start the video? <laughs> 
So welcome to the Leipzig Heart Center. We are presenting to you to, uh, today a case of a redo TAVI procedure. These are my disclosures. So the case is an 87-year-old male who presented to us um, with progressive dyspnea now being in New York Heart Association Class 3. The patient has several comorbidities, including an inferior infarction treated by PCI to the RCA in 2005, which was followed a few months later by a bypass surgery, two grafts to the LED and obtuse marginal. He had an ICD 2009 and a stroke in 2012, and was actually treated for a severe symptomatic AS back in 2012 with a 31 millimeter CoVAF device. He was considered at that time to be at high surgical risk and was 77 years old. He also had an LEA occlusion 2019, a pulmonary arterial embolism 2021, and he has chronic renal dysfunction. If you look back, or if we look back to the index TAVI procedure performed in 2012, you can see here that he had a big annulus of around 27, 28 millimeter. And at that time, he was treated with a 31 millimeter CoVAF device. As a reminder, this was a difficult device to implant. It was not repositionable, and it ended up as you see her, at a relatively low position, which was not uncommon at that time. And after post-dilatation, he had still a paravalvular leak, which was considered mild to moderate. And actually, this paravalvular leak persisted throughout the years, but it didn't cause any symptoms to the patient. The valve was functioning well at several time points during clinical follow-up and started to mildly degenerate in 2018 without causing any hemodynamic issues. And in 2020, you can see here that the non-coronary cusp was a little bit sclerotic, but valve opening was maintained and the patient was free of symptoms. So now echocardiography reveals um, severe structural uh, valve deterioration. The valve is calcified. Both the non and the left cusp uh, are sclerotic. The mean gradient is high, as you can see here, and the valve area is 0.7. And the PVL is as it is. And again, I remind you, it didn't cause problems during the course of his disease. His coronaries uh, now show a patent trite with patent stents. The left is completely occluded, but the grafts, as you can see here on this image, the lima and the venous graft to the marginal supply the territory of the left system completely and nicely. His CT now, as you can see here, shows this valve that is implanted in a rather deep position. It shows that the LVOT calcification we had has increased, so it increased both in thickness and in length. And you can see here that he has good transfemoral axis, and we'll get back to the details of the leaflet position in relationship to the coronaries in a minute. So a patient that has previously received TAVR due to higher risk is probably a good candidate for a DO-TAVR if this is um, anatomically feasible. But we don't have established guidelines on which device to use. There are emerging data that with a degenerating self-expanding valve, it's probably wise to use a short device in order to minimize the length of the neoskirt, but also in order to uh, have access to the coronaries. When it comes to the choice of the device, if we are going to take a balloon expandable one, then we have to consider which size and at which position. The size, it's a combination what we do currently of looking back at the native analyst. We did this already. And again, looking now at the true diameter of the index THV at the desired level of implantation. When it comes to positioning, you need to have good anchoring. Most importantly, you need to consider where the neoskirt will go to and if you have risk of coronary obstruction and whether you will have coronary access afterwards. And also you need to treat the degenerative pathology. So it could be wise to implant the valve at a deeper position if it's a regurgitation, but if it's a stenosis, you will probably need to implant it at a higher up position. So you've seen the native analysts at that time. This is the size of the inflow and at the annual level now. And you can see here that all of, of these measurements, they point to in the direction of choosing a 29 millimeter sapient device. When it comes to the position, as mentioned, if you implant the device deeper, you will have some leaflet overhang, but then you will probably shorten the neoskirt. If you implant it higher, and in this case, we think that we need to implant it higher and to pin the leaflets almost completely to treat the stenosis, then you will have a long neoskirt. And for the 31 millimeter valve, this neoskirt will be around 23 millimeter if we pin up completely, which is exactly where the right coronary artery originates. You can look here at the coronary angiogram, and it, um, as um, mentioned previously, you can see here that the right originates almost between node 7 and 8, which is a little bit, as we mentioned, at uh, 23 or 24 millimeter from the inflow. The left doesn't interest us. 
And this is why we try to imagine uh, how the right coronary artery will be impacted by the implantation of a 29 millimeter device, which will expand the core valve by around 2 to 2.5 millimeter at the level of the coronary. And you can see here that we have room of uh, 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 more than 3 millimeter uh, to the right coronary, which gives us the idea that even if we implant the device high, and this is our intention to implant it almost at node 7, that we will have complete leaflet pinning. We will have a very long nail skirt of 23, but this will not impair either flow nor access to the right coronary artery in this particular case. So uh, by that, uh, I would like to invite you to join us in the hybrid room to see how we're going to treat the case. Thank you very much. We have um, considered what the CT told us concerning uh, how to look at the core valve uh, without parallax, which is, I think, extremely important here. So we're not focusing on the native anatomy, we're focusing on the core valve device in order to be able to see it without any parallax and to be able to identify these different nodes we discussed in order to uh, be able to implant the valve at the desired position, which, as we said, will be around between node 6 and maybe so even going up to node 7. So we want to pin the leaflets because we think that there is no problem, definitely not with the left, which is occluded, and also with the right concerning this particular anatomy. Okay, so what we think of just, you, you need to be careful and you, may, you need to be sure that you're crossing really through the valve leaflets and that you're not entangled in any one of these stent struts. And this is why it will be important to judge your crossing in two different views and also to make sure that the catheter is crossing without any resistance. What you've seen here that we advanced the catheter um, without any resistance, which again speaks for the fact that we are intravalvular and we're not stuck somewhere between the stent struts. I mean, you can, of course, theoretically get out and get in again, but it, to tell you the truth, it doesn't feel like that. And we're now gonna Place our pick I think tail. the movement of the catheter, yeah. the, the, the wire is also quite liberal. Yes. So. Yes. Goes more or less smoothly. Yes. And we just leave it, uh, just leave the wire for a second, Philip, and to make it more visible. And then we'll just go around and see in different views. You can see here that it appears to be inside the stent frame throughout its course so it doesn't exit and re-enter again, which is very important here. No? So you can see here we are inside the frame. Okay, so we see that the invasive gradient is around 55 to 60. I mean, uh, remember that the echo we have is also like maybe one or two months old. Mm. So it, it seems that the gradient may have increased as well. Um, although the correlation between invasive and echo is not always one-to-one, -one, as we know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the usual um, loading of the device. We'll pay some attention now while crossing the arch. You can see here the sentinel device. Not really crossing until here is good. And then Philip is helping me now to get away from the valve frame. Now we have some resistance crossing the leaflets, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now we crossed with a little bit of push. Then we need to pay attention now a little bit to the hemodynamics. We're going to get the pusher up. And then maybe we mag a little bit, Philip. Magnify so, a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Big device, long device, so we'll go down and we are now concentrating. It will shorten up from below. Mm -hmm. So we're not focusing actually on the inflow of the sapien. We're more or less focusing on the outflow of the sapien valve. So I think we are now approaching node 6. Mein mm -hmm. Yeah. So we don't need an angiogram. We can just proceed, I think. Yeah. You agree? Yes. Okay. So of course it can 
It can move during move implantation, down. upwards and downwards. Probably it will move a little bit downwards. Pressure is good. Yes. Yeah. So let's start implanting. Wir würden jetzt mal pacen, bitte. Nicht erschrecken. Okay. Mm -hmm. Balloon up. Facing off. Down, facing off. So pressure is recovering. Patient is still doing fine. Pressure is coming. And you've seen that it remained more or less very stable at the upper uh, portion. And it shortened from below. And I think we ended up at node 7. So nice. let's look at the hemodynamics now, and it's uh, very satisfying to see that the gradient is abolished completely, actually. So the gradient of 50 or 60 is now actually almost zero. OK, we'll do an angiogram now, and let's see how it looks like. Angionches. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, it looks quite good. We ended up a little bit higher than we wanted, but I think it's still fine. You can appreciate here the filling of the right coronary artery. You can also see the origin of the right coronary artery due to the stents. So it seems to be exactly above the upper border of the uh, sapient frame, or maybe like originating from the uh, first row of cells of the sapient frame. At least angiographically, we don't see regurgitation. So uh, we don't see any regurgitation. We will need to check this with echo, of course, afterwards. Um, yes. So this is a Jutkin's left, uh, Jutkin's, this is a Jutkin's right, so 3.5. So a little bit of a short Jutkin's, so still not there. So this is a Jutkin's right 3.5, uh, which is nicely engaging the ostium. I mean, you can see that the ostium is marked by these stents. And it's exactly as we um, um, have um, seen on previous imaging and also at, as we discussed. So the ostium is exactly at the upper tip of the uh, implanted sapien valve. So I think. It's quite reassuring that we can yeah. engage the right uh, coronary artery, even if it's not very straightforward. It was even a little bit more complicated during the diagnostic angiogram. So now, as we now know how to get it, it was um, not a big issue to selectively engage it. So now we, we close the groin, as we usually do, with one proglide and, and one angioseal. Probably it would have been enough with the proglide yeah. in this case. But we took a very small angioseal, a six French angioseal, and let's uh, do an angiogram now, a final angiogram of the groin. Angionchus. Yeah. yeah, looks actually very nice. So, um, so the groin looks okay. Even with a pre-intervention and a prostar yes. implantation. Yeah, 2012, it was a prostar. But probably, I don't know, are these resorbable? Uh, the sutures? Sutures? No, no not resorbable. Or the prostar, they're not resorbable. Not resorbable. So if we open up now, we will find them? <laughs> yeah, Okay. probably. Okay. So we're now looking with transthoracic echo, as you can see here. Uh, we don't have a pericardial effusion. We checked this also in the subcostal view. You see here the position of the old core valve. The sapien is inside. So now let's do some color, please. And let's check if the paravalvular leak is still there. Doesn't look to be leaking, at least here on transthoracic echo. Remember, this was a rather big jet, as you've seen on the case presentation, and it appears to have disappeared now. So this is very encouraging. Again, it's a byproduct of what we did. It was not our aim, but it's good that we achieved this.
And now, finally, you can see here what, we, uh, uh, what we've captured in the embolic protection device. Not a lot of tissue, but you see here at least one big chunk of whatever this is. It could be calcium. It could be uh, some valvular tissue. It doesn't look to be a thrombus, um, at least from the color. Um, and I mean, you've seen this a lot. It's encouraging to see that we've captured something um, so that uh, um, we feel in the left at least carotid. that. Huh? This was in the left carotid artery. Yes. So, in the, so it was distal. in the, uh, yes, it was in the filter uh, that was placed in the left carotid artery. So we're happy that we fished this out and yeah. yeah. Okay, by that, we would like to thank you very much for having us uh, at uh, EuroPCR 2022. Um, thank you again for the whole team uh, for this um, um, fantastic case. And uh, of course, I would like to thank the patient for allowing us to film this and uh, hope to see you again very soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So that, so that was a very, uh, very uh, nice illustration of a valve in a degenerated transcatheter heart valve. Maybe, Stefan, before I go to, to Guy, Mohamed really was working with a giant there, huh? He was really working with a giant. Did you see that? He was like, yeah, was you, could, like you could that. also turn it the other way around, if you will. <laughs> oi, oi, don't, don't tell him that. Don't tell him that. Okay, so maybe, um, Guy, um, we've seen here a Sapien 3 in a failing uh, Evolute valve. What is your take on that? Is, it, is that the way to go? Or is it also possible to go off-label and treat a failing Evolute with another Evolute, for instance? Um, I believe that both are possible, right? We, we don't have the right answer for this question, as you know, right? Um, we did look, because of that, we, we did look into, that's the uh, data that we published, uh, this is TVT data. Uh, I want just everybody to full disclosure, these are very highly selected patients, right? These are the patients in whom the operators thought that the anatomy was very favorable for tower in tower. So just keep this in mind. Um, but I think it's, it's, it is possible. In, in this data, there's not much granularity. So I don't know which was the first valve that the patient had. But what I know for sure is that these patients, they all of them got Evolute for the tower in tower. There's 270 something patients that we looked into. And uh, the safety was, there was no case of coronary occlusion. As you can see, there are great hemodynamics. Uh, so I think, I don't know the answer for your question, um, but I think with the fact that we can, you know, perform commissure alignment, that's why it is important to perform commissure alignment today in the first valve, and then down the road, we're gonna do the second valve, also align the commissures and obviously the devices that are coming down the road are better, wider cells and, and they're working on larger cells for Evolute as well. So I think I would be comfortable, depends on the patient anatomy to do an Evolute inside an Evolute and also a Sapien inside an Evolute like was done here. Yeah, but clearly it's best practice to apply commissural alignment in all your TAVI cases, correct? Absolutely. Nicole. Yeah, David, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, um, some of the technical details of this valve and valve procedure. Um, first, I think cerebroembolic protection is a must. Um, second, so you saw how he was pushing forward and there was a bit of resistance mm. crossing this valve. Do you suggest that we pre-dilate? Uh, is there a risk of maybe uh, you know, breaking off a piece? Because the same way as you're pushing, you can tear a bit of a leaflet uh, is it maybe safer um, you know, and less traumatic to do a balloon? And the second question is on positioning. Any tips and tricks on how to position these valves? Is that um, you know, more or less difficult than a native valve or the I same? Think it, I think it's much, much more easy it, you know, to position them with a n native valve. I think for pre-dilatation, you definitely are risking having some emboli. If, if you want to predilate. So I don't think, you know, whereas in the native valve, sometimes you have difficulty because there's really bulky calcified leaflets. In this setting, I, I wouldn't really be keen to predilate even with the cerebral protection filter in place because of course it doesn't protect the whole brain. Um, as far as positioning, I think you saw there nicely, they don't have to have any uh, angiographic contrast use. You aim for which node you think is going to be the right one, depending on where the coronaries are coming off. And then you implant the valve as they nicely did under rapid pacing. So I, don't, I think 
fundamentally, these are, are, are in execution, these are very straightforward procedures, but in planning, they're much more complex. Thank you. So, Nicholas, you want to uh, maybe give away some key learnings? Sure. So I think uh, what, we, what we learned in this session is at least uh, that we are moving, and rightfully so, moving to low-risk patients, patients who are younger. But that in that context, obviously, we have to be very uh, considerate in terms of valve durability and longevity. And uh, we are gathering more and more data that the Evolute Pro valve, Evolute Pro Plus, which is the valve that we at least have in, in Rotterdam for the time being, is a proven but ever improving platform. And this is very important. We keep on improving and we keep on learning as a community uh, from our experiences. I think contemporary implantation techniques may further reduce the pacemaker rates, may also further improve uh, PVLs, and I think uh, what Sabine mentioned, uh, moderate PVL, especially in young, younger patients, low-risk patients, is not acceptable. But we do have the technology now to avoid those scenarios. Um, in that regard, we also have to consider a patient-tailored valve selection, and this is also where CT planning is very instrumental. Sometimes it's valve A, other times it's valve B that might be the most appropriate platform. But it's fair to say that the durability of the core valve Evolute platforms has proven to be the best in class. And I think uh, today we also have the, the most recent data from the UK TAVI registry that also seems to suggest that this Evolute platform is very robust in terms of durability and uh, longevity. With that, uh, I believe we are coming to the end of this session. Thank you very much, Nicolo, Stefan, Guy, Sabine, and David. Thank you all for your attention, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Enjoy PCR.